Australian artists. And it, and it became apparent through the 60s, and I think what the Yellow House was, was a kind of answer to that crisis. It was a certain, a certain group of artists' answers, answers to it. There were sort of a number of answers came out of that crisis, critical state of the arts in the 60s. And say crisis. I mean, to me, it wasn't as dramatic as a crisis. I mean, it was just lack of interest. I found the, the art scene very, sort of, uh, very uninteresting in Australia, I think. As dramatic as a crisis. I mean, it was just lack of interest. I found the, the art scene very, sort of, uh, very uninteresting in Australia, I think. Yeah, well, I and, think that... Uh, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't become exciting to me until I met all you guys at the other house. So, hey, this is what artists should be like. Yeah, well, that's what we were doing at the Yellow House was was, was coming out coming out of this out of this crisis, out of this crisis of Americanization, for instance. You know, we had kind of no real cultural specificity of we had no grounds in Australia. Like art, art had been virtually taken over by America. We were coming out of, of things like hard edge minimalism, pop art, where we'd seen a, a terrific breakdown or the uh, you know the uh, kind of social disengagement of the artist. Um, and unless you were actually working within the kind of avant-garde milieu, the formalist or modernist tradition, you weren't getting a look in on anything. And the crisis really developed out of those things, the, the terrific commercialization of art in the 60s. The um, de-skilling of art was another, another, uh, another area where art schools at that stage started to just uh, cope with the, with the current style. So it was felt that any other kind of area wasn't worth worth bothering with. Um, the people that we en ended up with in the Yellow House were much more aware of a whole variety of different tools and mediums and expressions that they could use because I think uh, we did have have a real concept of art or a wider concept of art. Mm. And it was the first time all these various concepts were worked together. Was it? Yeah. Well, it was it, the first time I was aware of it being brought together. Well, well there'd been sort of the Ubu light shows and so on earlier on, and, and they, they came out, really, well, it, it sort of grew out of a whole a lot of things, like the radicalisation of the students mm. through the kind of Vietnam War. And there were two areas there. It was one where, and I, this particularly affected me, where as an, as an artist, I believed that art transcended politics at that stage. Mm. That's a view I don't hold now, and, it, and largely because of things like the Yellow House that, that, that grew me out of it. But at that stage, I could go quite comfortably with the kind of Clement Greenbergian formalist ideas. You know that art had its own aesthetics, and, and it was that was the me the meaning of art was within its within itself. Um, but I I became aware through the by marching in Vietnam protests, by getting involved with light shows, by uh, well, just the, the the strongly kind of repressive society, the corporation of that we were kind of living through, that there was a real sort of crisis. There was a split between uh, my political awareness and my knowledge of it and the aesthetic ideology that I was purveying in my art. The, the, right. the two things started to kind of disjunct. And um, part of the kind of effort of resolving that was this kind of movement into, into light shows, into theatre work, you know, into... Uh, well, you did the light show here. Yeah, and I eventually became involved with hair. I was involved with hair from the beginning through my work with Ubu, which Albie Thompson got me involved with. What were you doing for Ubu? Well, Ubu, I was just working with working with the uh, lighting sequences in, right. in envi you know, in the environment, in the happenings, and so on, in the, in the rock concerts and the, uh, the multimedia festivals that they were putting up at the, at the Greek Theatre in, in Darlinghurst. Um, so I hadn't met you at that stage. Yeah, I I came in. I got involved in lighting through the um, through the Up and Alley Dance Theatre, and I'd had had contact with them early in the 60s, and then say 65, 64, they came out here on a on a three month tour, which was enormously extended tour for the time, and. Um, I was working, well I picked up with some of the people I'd met in 1962, reconnected with them and at that stage I was painting and I was about to go to Melbourne to work with Janet Dawson in the lithographic studio at Gallery A and that coincided with uh, Alvin Ailey's three months in, Amer in, in Melbourne 
and they had a series of crises and eventually I was taken on as their assistant to the stage manager who was a fellow called Nick Chernovich who had worked with John Cage, Rauschenberg and all these people at Black Mountain College in the States. Um, they'd also were very involved in the LSD culture in America. They'd um, worked with Leary, they'd, he'd actually dropped acid with Leary. And, so it was a very interesting period to come in on. They were also very involved in, in Chinese philosophy, the, the I Ching and that, the Taoist kind of uh, background. So all these things coming in the mid-60s, you know, this was just pre-Australia's real involvement with the Vietnam, pre-Harold Holt all the way. But it brought up a terrific, um, oh, well, it was a marvellous insight for a sort of small-town Australian lad at that stage, because I didn't have any international kind of experience. Yeah. The UV light shows. Mm. Tell me, why, why do you think there aren't many artists working in light these days? There used to be dozens of us. Well, it's, it's mystified, man. Yeah, it's been a bit of a switch back to the art object. I think uh, and, uh, and another thing about the light shows was that it, that it, it was a revolution against the commercialisation of art. It was something that, like music, it was there, you, you were in part of the experience, a little like the Christo showdown stuff. You either were there at the time or, or it, it, did, it, it no longer existed. It wasn't a commercial prospect. Really. Life. Yeah. And uh, I think the 80s have seen a return to the art as a material object, you know, that the, the ubiquitous, whatever it is, as it's, it's, always it's brought itself back in. Bit. Buying and selling of art, mm -hmm. the increasing in value of art, and all this sort of stuff. Has it? Yeah. Uh, it's it's it. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Well, it's a matter of the definition of what art is, I suppose. Yeah. No, well, it goes back to you know, yeah, the individual conce individuals' concepts of art. You know, I think Martin called the Yellow House one of the greatest conceptual works of art ever seen. Well, I think some of the people actually who were working in the 70s in conceptual art would, would tend to disagree I think, uh, with that. But it was conceptual in, in, an, in a number of ways. Um, for instance, um, the art... It, well, how can we explain it? <laughs> these well, are hard, these I, pregnant pauses, aren't they? I, I was thinking, I mean, it was conceptual. I mean, a lot of, so much of it was realised. Is it then also conceptual art? I mean, if, it's, if it becomes realised, is it still conceptual? That was the thing I felt about the other house. It was conceptual dreams, which had suddenly been made real. Yeah, well, it was looking for a... What was it? Not a greater awareness, but it was, I mean, the, the catch words of those things were higher consciousness, wasn't it? It was like That's right. to get away from the banal or to kind of discover the kind of mystery in the, in the reality. And the, the um, influences that we were kind of involved with at that stage, apart from Vincent, who, oh, Vincent van Gogh, who was obviously the, the main criteria, was the uh, work of Hermann Hesse. And in particular, the case of the, particularly the case of Steppenwolf, um, where you had Harry Haller, you know, this kind of isolated loner, sort of in his fifties, a little bit closer to what we think. We can't. Who uh, wandering through the streets of uh, wherever it was, Wapatal, wherever he wherever he was, struck this sign, the the, the Magic Theatre, you know, admission not for everyone. Yeah. Price uh, or mine. Yeah, at entrance not for everyone. Price of admission, your mind. And uh, we sort of went into the Magic Theatre with, with Harry Haller, you know, and, and like 10 doors, 100 doors, 1,000, 10,000 doors. Behind each door was exactly what you were seeking. So it was conceptual in that, in that sense that it was coming from your idea. Uh, and the, the, the fascinating imagery of... of Hess, you know, where Haller eventually is sentenced by a court with Mozart sort of as the, as the judge to sentence to death for stabbing, stabbing an imaginary woman to death with an imaginary knife was very appealing, you know, to, it had, a, had an imaginative resonance that was kind of alive for someone, you know, like after coming through those kind of Vietnam protests and that sort of uh, 
yeah, strong endeavour to kind of constantly be pushing consciousness, to be pushing the kind of uh, against uh, that uh, you know control that you felt coming from corporation, that you felt coming from government, you know, that you felt there were. Uh, uh, so it was, a, it was again, it was an, an instance of revolution, you know, whereas was questioning the reality that was being thrust upon him. Yeah. And that, that revolution really kind of came back to individualism, it came back to a kind of spontaneity. And again, which was again anti this kind of Americanization of art, you know, of the kind of formal uh, forbidding object, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, you know, you found that by allowing yourself to that thing, you actually, you became, you almost became the object of art history rather than a kind of acting, sensitive, realizing person. So the thing was to, to, to break that pull and, uh, the Yellow House for me, actually, I, in retrospect, became that gateway that I was able to pass through where I did shed the kind of American influences that I was carrying. The work I've actually got in the, in the Yellow, or had in the Yellow House, was a mixture of that, the beginning of that transition. So it was a, it was a terrific transitional means, you know. It, it took that kind of hard edge uh, and minimal art and it, it kind of threw it together with Eastern mysticism. With the concept of the uh, with the mandala, which linked it back into the kind of young archetypal unconscious, uh, and then back out through that into the dream, which again comes back out through Herman Hesse. We're starting to see realizations of that now in, in people like David Lynch's movies, things like Blue Velvet. You know, I think they, they're starting to bring that kind of thing back to life vividly. Mm. Shall we go into spooky land? Right. Right now. Okay, we're going to have a. <laughs> Oh, oh, it's a lot of shit, mate. Huh? It's a lot of ver verbal nonsense. Oh, I know, I know, I know, but you know, we've, got to, we've got to fight verbal nonsense with verbal nonsense, mate. <laughs> you know, I'm fascinated how the kind of light levels work in here with the video. Does it, does it pick oh, up on oh, that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Very strong. Looks like neon on this one in the video. D does it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's enough reflected light from the fluorescent paint to light you and I and everything else. No, that's what, that was what fascinated me about this thing you can was. See the, the glowing from the painting. You can see lighting the side of my face. Here, so. Yeah. And yours. Yeah. Very nicely, too. So. Thank you. <laughs> but I was fascinated with that idea that. Um, all isn't what we see. Like this relates back to again to Magritte's ideas. Like when, when we looked for a kind of visual equivalent of Harry Haller, you know, or Steppenwolf, or, or Herman Hesse's imagination, you know, you can see the the, the, the straight move to Magritte. The man with the, the apple in front of his face. Absolutely, but the man, the man who, yeah, the man who said this, you know, this this is this is not a pipe, you know, who said that the image is not the thing itself, you know. Mm. Um, so we're very much involved in that, that the, the experience of the thing. Which is a little bit of modernism found back in there, but the idea that that below you kind of uh, that we, that we trust the we trust our senses, you know. I mean, it's fascinating when you look at the Tibetans' kind of view of the senses. They've they've got a kind of twenty seven separate identifiable things happen between sighting an object and actually registering an association in your brain through their kind of meditative process. But below that kind of level of hearing, there's something else that you can hear, like in a, in, you can hear the sea in a seashell. Mm. And I suppose with, with the kind of electromagnetic spectrum that there's a kind of level just below visual light that we, can, that we can't see, but that this German scientist in 1800 discovered these iodine keratase or whatever they are, there's some complex iodine molecule that when it's hit by this invisible radiation, gets overexcited, you know, and as it settles back into its normal state, it emits this photon of, of light. And depending on what its particular molecules are, that photon will be a particular colour. And uh, so it was wonderful to, like, to, to, to bring this invisibility up to bear. So th these pictures are actually projecting light. They're not like we'd normally look at a picture as, a, as something reflected. But it's actually light projecting out like a television screen. It's the same technology as a, as a television screen. Light emitting paintings. Absolutely, they are. Um, 
And it's fascinating to switch them on and off using white light, but unfortunately we're unable to achieve that, that effect at this stage. But you actually get a complete polarisation looking at the Magritte picture where you've got a pale blue star on a dark violet background. If we fade white light up back into that, you suddenly reach a balance where those pale blue stars become absolute black dots on a white, mm. clear white background. So it's like the positive negative thing too, the negative of the light. Um, well, it helps to illustrate that everything you see is in your cerebral cortex. It does help to illustrate that, Roger. <laughs> <right, doesn't it? laughs> yeah. Or to bring another literary reference into this, Edgar Allan Poe. All that we see or seem is but a dream, a dream within a dream. I'm glad you glad you brought Edgar Allan Poe in, into it because uh, uh, it, uh, the, the whole the whole dream uh, mechanism was very much of what the Yellow House was. You know, it, the idea of actually creating an environment that <clears throat> that was constantly under change, and you can see that in some of the photographs out the Greg's photographs. Like uh, we can have a look at them, but the with a, with a nude figure on the uh, with the breasts. Next, right. next, next to the original sort of mannequin, Magritte mannequin, mm. uh, suddenly becomes the Brett's Rembrandt, Brett's portrait of Rembrandt. Mm. Yeah, but, the, but the thing it was that constantly changing over thing. Like people used to get lost in there for days. I think it was like being in a dream, living in a living in a dream. Yeah. Well, it was about as far away from ordinality that you could get, particularly those days in Sydney. It was a very grey place, it just post Menzies. People would look at you strangely if you wore a coloured shirt walking down George Street. Yeah, it had, it had sort of advanced a, a little bit from the from the early 60s, like uh, coming out of art school in the early 60s. The place really was was a dump. Grim. Yeah, um, I've always been actually had a very soft spot for Sydney, you know, and, and as, a as, as a city, Sorry. yeah, as a kind of network of. Bohemian lanes, which mm. Harry Seidler has managed to destroy, you know, absolutely without leaving much evidence of, of this charming kind of almost Parisian city at the, mm. at the time. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I never got too depressed about the greyness of the city because I was always blessed with a good group of friends, and mm. and um, I had to stand on Wynyard Station to get a train home every afternoon. Yeah, that was pretty grim. That, that is pretty good. Reminded good. me of the uh, John <laughs> Brack's uh, painting of Collum Street, Melbourne. Yeah, the faceless, faceless crowds. Mm. It always fascinates me watching, I used to stand on the Harbour Bridge to watch the sunsets and occasionally you'd turn your back on the sunset, you'd see a double-decker bus, they had these wonderful going past with every, every face turned to a newspaper. Yeah, you know, it was just looking, extraordinary. Looking at a picture of a sunset. Perhaps. Yeah, but a grey, a grey, <laughs> another sheet of greys. <laughs> yeah. Yep, so but in a way the Yellow House was very much about colour. You know, we all we all use colour as an emotional state. We all use the use the emotions. I, one of the critics of this show was that, that it, it tends to be shop not shop decoration but so much but art decoration in that we, we induce a mood in a in a person, that we we induce a passivity in a kind of viewer rather than a kind of active participation. I d I don't think that's I don't find, I haven't found that the case. I found the participation to be extremely active. Mm. That that when you actually do change people's uh, environment, you do change their consciousness, and it and it and it sparks a creative. It's a creative spark that it, cha it does. Cha I think uh, it's in the in the record books out there. The the enthusiasm, you know, of people coming through this exhibition that they have responded creatively. That something's happened. Well, they don't feel they have to tip and toe through and not talk as if they're in the presence of God or something. I think you know, too many gallery experiences these days are uh, reminiscent of uh, religions of uh, cathedrals. I think people go to galleries to worship a lot of the time these days. And that was the exciting thing about this exhibition is that people don't react that way. They feel they can come here and have fun. Like they play the piano, it's got please play me on it. They actually do it. You know? Even if they can't play. They, they do do that, yeah. And you know, like you're going to have to dig a long, long way into art theory to find the reason, <laughs> reason for that, that kind of extroversion, aren't you? Yeah. Now it is slightly beyond the painted word. I think we've, we have seen, oh, you know, why has this show been just as successful as, as, the, as the original Yellow House? Is, it, is a good question. Is it because people have become um, 
more open through through perspectives. Has that made a difference to through biennales, through a, introducing them to so-called high-level avant-garde art, the best avant-garde art from uh, international? Yeah. Or is it because it's self-explanatory? Or is it, you, know, you know, does it even does it need an explanation? Is that where? I think people can feel relaxed here. They don't feel threatened. But I don't know why. Hmm. Do you think we could have? Yeah, yeah. Well, I said if we're talking about conceptual art earlier, I suppose one of the differences between it is that um, conceptual art, rather than using the language of forms to to discuss concepts of art, actually started to research and look at the language of art itself. So it sort of withdrew from the actual art object. Um, the Yellow House is, is halfway between those two things. Well, you're certainly using the language. I'm certainly using the language of art to make statements about feelings and passions and and uh, also to make statements about concepts of art, about what a, uh, what art is through its, through its um, objects. Um, well, the beauty of this piece is that, uh, that you're in it. This is art you can get into. Yeah, Literally. yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the other side, of the, the other side of both this this one and the corridor, of, the corridor of stars and the tunnel of love is oh. is. Uh, Have you renamed this? Is this the corridor of stars? Now? This. I thought this was spooky land. It, no, spooky, it's spooky the land. Room on the tag over there, spooky, land, the spooky land. Spooky land. Spooky land was always. Spooky land. spooky land was always made up of two sections. The corridor of stars. Which um, had actually had the original Kama Sutra in, and the Tunnel of Love, which you entered through the Fur Tunnel. So it was actually Spooky Land was the generic title, right. and there were actually two sections. There was a narrow corridor, the Tunnel of Love, going into a broader mm. space, which was the Corridor of Stars with the ping pong ceiling, which we haven't got here. We haven't done that yet. We haven't done that yet. No. Well, I mean, you really have to live here, don't you, to get a car? So this became more of a comment, a gallery comment in, in this particular phase. It became four walls with four paintings on them mm. and totally simplified down. You know, there was sort of uh, a little bit of conflict with some of my other members in, in this magic theatre section, you know, about the sparseness of it. But mm. uh, as a personal kind of thing, I, I went for the sparseness uh, deliberately. Um, in retrospect, I mean, I'm still not sure. I mean. I think it was the right way to do it. I would, I would have liked the ping pong ball, just personally. I'd like to do it completely differently, <laughs> you know. I'd, <laughs> I'd really like to overdo it, you know. <laughs> Whereas it's, this is kind of, it is maybe moderately underdone, I'd say, at this stage. Mm. I mean, we could have used the tape sculptures, the ping pong balls. Even the water floor would have been fascinating when you look back at the original plan. Yes, and the little what Vincent, that would have... the Vincent starry night strobes. Yeah, can you can you actually see it in this space? Oh, how, yeah, how it would have been? Oh, it would have been wonderful. How would have the water floor worked? Oh. Yeah. Oh, so it would have kept it really low, and you see, because of, because everything's dark blue, it's all very distancing. It's like being in a in the ether. Yeah. No, so I felt space ether before they realised there was nothing there. Yeah. And it feels like you're being in the ether rather than standing on something black. You know, that's what's. And with the water floor, you would have had a really low level. Of light in very, very light blue. It's floating on top of this very dark blue that seems to go on. It's, it's, uh, it's mm. like a little, like a dark, fluffy cloud. Mm. It's, and your, eye, your eyes can't quite focus on that ultraviolet light. That helps. <laughs> this is the ultraviolet light <laughs> helps. Yeah. If you can't focus on it. And so it's like looking at something that's a three dimension because your eyes don't know where to focus. No, that's what gives it its spatial thing. Mm. The, originally, that one was painting was shown in a black velvet black velvet room with a kind of strobe light and a, and a dimmer, and it was extremely disorienting. You know, so it completely alienated your sense of space at all. And that's what you're talking about is seeing the same thing. You didn't know whether you're on the floor, a little bit like a diver with the bends. Um, this this particular room hasn't achieved that that same effect, but uh, I think it's added. I've, well, I mean, I'm justifying it now, but uh, in, in, a, in its ambience, it is a kind of balance to the yellow room. The bright sort of Vincent room is like the outside sunlight. Mm -hmm. This is like the kind of inner consciousness. Again, it's going back to that kind of mandalic uh, 
well, meditative, well, contemplative thing. It's a very centering. Here. Yeah, well, it's a matter of kind of living with it for a while, seeing, and letting it sort of perform. It's a quite a slow performance, but it's a, it's a challenge to, um, you know, the the video, the the, uh, the thirty second take. Yes. <laughs> Let's see if we can find Twitter. Yeah, let's get out of here. Yeah. You want to go? Yeah. Did you get? Did you get? Look, here's the thing. Here's the window. I'm going in. That's the way. Dance. That's great. That's great.